All right. So good evening once again, everyone. So there's quite a lot of you on tonight's webinar, which is very good. So this brings us to part six of seven. And today we're going to be talking about the non-surgical rhinoplasty. And I do appreciate a lot of the support that I'm getting. And I know it can be a little bit difficult given that a lot of this is just theory, you know, talking through the, the injection techniques and the anatomy. But given the current scenarios worldwide, it's obviously difficult for me to, to, to actually perform a non-surgical rhinoplasty and, and show you. But as I was saying earlier on, and I've been saying this throughout the series of webinars, is keep showing the support, liking the, 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 the comments and, and subscribing to the YouTube channel. So I've put it in the, in the link below for you guys to have a look as well as the link for the next week's webinar. Now, next week's webinar is going to be on complication management, same time, same day. And it, there's a limited number of spaces intentionally for next week. So, you know, you guys that are watching me here today live, you've got, you know, first row seats, so to speak. So do click on that link and do register for next week's free webinar on complication management and aesthetics. And it doesn't matter at what level you guys are at, whether you're beginners or advanced, I'm sure there'll be something for you guys to take away. So without further ado, we will make a start. If you have any questions, we'll go through them as always towards the end. And if you look at this on, on the screen just now, you'll see my Instagram page, um, which is my, you know, my, my, my um, cosmetics in Instagram page. So feel free to, to always you know, hit me up with a message afterwards if you have any questions or anything clinical related where, where you can send me pictures in a more confidential manner. So what we'll be cover covering today, so we'll look at facial profiling in general. And as some of you may know, this will cover the chin, lips and cheeks. And we've covered this in previous webinars, but we'll look at facial profiling and the, the impact the nose has on the face, as well as the anatomy and an injection technique. So as always, the theme has always been the same. And, you know, predominantly the focus will be on the anatomy when it comes to the non-surgical rhinoplasty, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions um, you know, regarding how it's done and what tools are used. So, looking at the non-surgical rhinoplasty, what exactly is it? And a basic definition is using a dermal filler to address nasal defects. Now, these could be mild, these could be a little bit more severe, but what is the benefit of doing the rhinoplasty non-surgically or the liquid rhinoplasty, the filler rhinoplasty, the medical rhinoplasty? And there's some very obvious answers for this. And one, it is safe. You know, historically, many years ago, you, you, even when I was a child, a lot of plastic surgery was ha being done, so surgical rhinoplasty. And often patients would have a defect or a slight defect post-surgery. And even then, it was very useful to be using you know, dermal fillers to, to correct these minor changes. So we know it's got a proven track record. It is very safe. Um, it's, it's less invasive compared to surgery, less costly, obviously. And there's very little to no downtime. It's a very tight compartment around the mid face. And, you know, we're not, you're not going to be grossly swollen um, post-treatment. So there's very little downtime. It, you know, it's probably wrongly classified as, as the, the lunchtime procedure, if you like, because it's done within, within minutes, you know, within five, 10 minutes and you have a brand new nose, it'll last about a year. And there's no scarring involved and there's no general anesthetic. So there's a lot of positives to the non-surgical rhinoplasty. And if it's done correctly, it, you know, um, amazing. So... The, for me personally, you know, the, the nose really does define the face. And I know often we will say it's the eyes, you know, the eyes are the windows to the soul or it's the lips that decide how sexy the face is. But, you know, the, the nose can make or break a face. And some very common faces here, you'll see the Kardashian, um, you know, Scarlett Johansson, Charlie Theron, Angelina Jolie. And you'll see the duchesses on the top right. Now, everybody's nose is slightly different. So if you look here at the screen here, you'll see Kim Kardashian, the relatively straight-ish nose and slightly curved around the infratip region. Whereas if you look at Charlize Theron over here in the third picture, she's got a more uh, upwards turning nose. And comparing Angelina Jolie's nose, which is quite thin and chiseled, compared to Scarlett Johansson's nose, which is slightly wider. But 
a lot of you would agree that each and every single one of them is beautiful. Now, I've also given you a couple of examples here um, on the top right. So this is Kate and Megan. And you can see here that especially in Megan's face on profile view, there's a slight dorsal hump. But she doesn't have surgery. She has not had any non-surgical procedures. And she is still perceived as beautiful by the general public. Now, that's a very important point to take note because often as practitioners, we, we simply see, oh, there's a dorsal hump in the nose. You get very excited. It's a two minute job. Let's fill it above, fill it below. They have a straight nose because it's a very automatic, automated system that we have running in our brains, thinking that a straight nose automatically means more beautiful. And that's not necessarily the case. Hence why I've included a picture in here. And same with um, Kate as well. You'll see there's a very subtle dorsal hump over here. Okay, so everybody's nose doesn't need to look like one of the Kardashians. So what actually makes a beautiful nose? Well, it, a straight nose is obviously going to be beautiful because the eye likes to perceive straight lines or, or symmetrical lines, um, or sometimes what we call a, a nice ski slope, you know, where the nose begins to just elevate ever so slightly inferiorly. Um, a good projection of the tip. So here we're talking about the profile view, we're talking about the, the aesthetic dorsal lines, or more importantly, the light reflex. So especially when light is shining on the face, does it give the impression of having that chiseled look to the mid face? And obviously golden ratio proportions, which we'll cover later on. So what are the indications of a non-surgical rhinoplasty? So these are just a few that I've put together, which I find are quite common. Um, and, and the most common is the dorsal hump correction, without a shadow of doubt. If you have a flat nasal bridge, so which type of people would you commonly see this in? In, in the, those from the Far East, so Chinese or um, in, in Asian people, they tend to have flat, flat nasal bridges. So what will they complain of? Often when they put their glasses on, the glasses tend to be quite loose or they fall off because they have no nasal bridge. So this is a very common problem that I do see in my clinical practice. Nasal tip ptosis, which we'll talk on, on how you would uh, sort this issue out. Deviated nose, yes, and reduction of the alar width. Now, as with everything, when it comes to non-surgical measures, you need to know where to draw the line. So somebody with a severe ptosis of the, of the nose or extreme um, septal deviation, there's probably very little you're going to be able to improve it on. So therefore, they need to be referred to your surgical colleagues. So what are the actual options non-surgically? So as many of you would know, the most common one is hyaluronic acid and other options would include non-hyaluronic um, acid, acid fillers, for example, calcium hydroxyapatite or poly L-lactic acid. Threads are another option that I tend to use as well. And they tend to be barbed threads, um, which I won't talk about too much detail. Um, I think it's beyond the scope of this um, short webinar and botulinum toxin, which does have a very important role when it comes to addressing the nose. But coming back up, looking at the first point here on hyaluronic acid, I've made a note of two terms here, cohesivity and G prime. And cohesivity basically means how sticky a product is. And then the G prime is essentially um, the, the lifting ability. So think what you want to do with the nose before you choose your product. So what are we trying to achieve in the nose? We, we want a product that's going to to stand and stay where it is and create a nice projection. And we want it to be very cohesive, very sticky. We don't want it to be overly moldable or so it spreads. So ideally you want a product that's very cohesive and has a moderate to high G prime level. My filler of choice um, for the non-surgical rhinoplasty, again, it depends on the, on the clinical scenario I have in front of you, or you have in front of you, sorry. Um, and I have been using the Luminera Deep or the Ultra Deep um, fillers. Just one last point I'll, I'll very quickly make with the non-HA fillers. Some of you may be huge fans of using calcium hydroxyapatite or polyolactic acid. And my only word of advice for those of you that are relatively new to facial aesthetics is probably not to do those things in the nose. Um, unless you're, you're very confident with the anatomy and the technique, then just stick to hyaluronic acid because yes, you can still get some nasty complications, but they can still, to an extent, be reversed. 
So let's dive into the anatomy. So hopefully you'll appreciate all these diagrams, which is um, from Jiong Hu et al, uh, just from a few years ago, actually. And you'll see the references at the bottom of all these slides. So just taking a look at the basic anatomy first of the, of the nose, knowing where the dorsum is, what, what the dorsum is, what the alar lobules are, and the columella. Um, and this is a very important point, if you look here on the bottom right, because some of you may be injecting noses already using a needle, and what you'll find is when you're above the dorsal hump in the midline, as the needle goes down, you, you know you're gonna be on periosteum, and then, you're in, and then you inject. But as you come lower down the nose, so if you look here, what you'll see is cartilages, which, is, which are actually broken down into the upper cartilages and then the lower cartilages. And what you'll find is that once the fine needle goes into the nose, you're at a very high risk of penetrating cartilage. So knowing how deep for that needle to go in is also very important. Otherwise, you're just wasting the product. Muscles are very important uh, in the nose, and I know often we, we always think about the vascularity, but we'll talk about that in, in the next slide. And these four muscles, for me personally, are probably the, the, the most important when it comes to deciphering a treatment plan with the nose. So if you look at this diagram here, you'll see in green is the nasalis muscle. Okay, so this is the transverse-like muscle, and it will run down in a horseshoe-like shape. And then this is your nasalis muscle also, but over the alar region, okay? Down here in green is your depressor septi nasi muscle. And you'll also have your dilator nasi uh, muscles and your elevators. So the reason why this is very important regarding the nose is a lot of patients will often come in saying, I've got a droopy nose or nasal ptosis, nose ptosis, or or, or a, you know, you know, a, a curved uh, tip to the nose. So what can you do? So the first thing it's very important is that you assess the patient, obviously, and assess them on exa uh, on um, animation. By that, what I mean is when you're looking at them from a profile view, you want them to stay still with your eyes on the tip of the nose, and then you want them to smile. And then you want to assess to see if the tip of the nose moves. And typically, it will go inferiorly. And if that's the case, what does that tell you? So that tells you that there's a, there's a muscle issue here. So botulinum toxin is going to be your way forward first, review patient two weeks later, and then consider doing dermal fillers. Just my way of working. So if you're looking at this diagram here, you'll see in green down here is your depressor septi muscle. This attach, um, attaches to the base of the nose um, and the infratip region, and it pulls the, the tip of the nose down on animation when we smile. So two and a half to five units of international Botox into this region normally works like magic. But it's important to know what the elevators and the compressors are of the nose, because using toxin, we can also address the, the width, especially the ALAR to ALAR width. So this will give you a brief overview regarding the vascularity of the nose. And <clears throat> these diagrams will you know, give you a nice little overview. And here I've made a list of, of certain arteries and vessels that we do need to be aware of. So if you take a look at this diagram here on the top, um, the large one here, you'll see the facial artery, which we know is very tortuous, runs to the, the, the level of the modiolus, runs near the um, nasal labia fold, and one of the branches it will give off would be the lateral nasal artery. It continues as the angular artery, um, which also will give off very small branches. And we also have here the dorsal nasal artery, which is a branch of um, the ophthalmic artery. So that's a, you know, a, a route from basically the internal carotid system. So we need to be very careful here because the supratrochlea, the dorsal nasal, are branches of the ophthalmic artery, which we know gives rise to the central retinal artery. So anything going wrong, especially on the, in the superior aspect of the nose or in the glabella or the infraglabella region is gonna be very high risk. And we'll talk about actual complications next week, but just to be aware of. So to summarize, the main two vessels of the nose we're gonna be talking about are the lateral nasal artery, which tends to sit in the alar crease. And as a general rule of thumb, wherever there's a crease in the face, you're gonna find a vessel 
deep to it. So you've got the lateral alar crease, which you'll have your lateral nasal artery, and then just off the midline, you'll have your dorsal nasal artery. Now, the other the artery that's very important is the columella artery. So this is a branch of the superior labi artery. You'll see it down over here. Um, this is a very good picture. So you've got the superior labi artery coming up, and then it will branch and give you the columella artery. Okay, and there's a lot of anastomosis that happens in the tip of the nose. So what does this mean regarding injection technique? Well, quite simply, knowing where the arteries are and what they call simply is it enough. Knowing the depth is, is the most important thing. And I, I will always say this, especially when I'm teaching, is when it comes to injections anywhere in the face, it's all about the depth of the tip of that needle or cannula. Okay, so it's all about injection depth. And what we know about these vessels in particular, especially the lateral nasal, the dorsal nasal, and the columella, is they are not deep. They tend to be relatively superficial, and they tend not to be in the midline. So the midline tends to be more or less a safe zone for us to be working in. A very important question to ask um, before any non-surgical rhinoplasty and you know, I've, I'll, I've, I've, I'll cover this next week in, in, in the Club of Complications um, webinar as to why I ask this, um, because I've, I have had my own fair share of problems, which is why now it's grilled into my head why I always ask this question. But have they had a surgical rhinoplasty before? And what you'll find is most patients that have, have had a surgical rhinoplasty, they tend not to stop at one. Why? Because they're never happy with the nose. So they tend to have a second operation, a third, a fourth. I know a lot of colleagues personally that have had three, four, five rhinoplasties because they're never happy. Um, so it's always important to ask, have they had something done surgically before and how many have they had? And the reason behind this is there's going to be a lot of fibrotic tissue. And yes, more or less on the average person that's never had surgery before, we know roughly where the arteries are. But obviously, once you've had surgery, there's going to be this anatomical distortion beneath. There's going to be excess fibrotic tissue. So, you know, it's a very high-risk arena that, that we're going to be entering in. So they are high-risk patients. Does it mean that you don't treat them? Not necessarily. So if you're still a novice when it comes to the non-surgical rhinoplasty, then, you know, stay clear and refer to colleagues. But if, if, if you're feeling confident, then there are certain things that you can use, for example, a cannula. So just a very uh, cartoony type of diagram, so to speak, just to show you that there's various types of nose, um, you know, and th th everything's gonna be perceived slightly differently. So as much as we as practitioners are trying to make aesthetics very objective, it is still a very subjective topic. And these are just, uh, just to show you that there are very, you know, several variations of the nose. So what do you do when it comes to assessment? So most importantly, two views, spatial view, so full on and profile view. And one of the most important things is the apex of the nose. And we often think, yeah, they've got a slight dorsal hump. Let's just go above the hump and just fill it and, and, and lift and just create a straight nose. And sometimes, yep, it's relatively straightforward to do. But the issue that we can have here is we will masculinize the patient which is called romanization, if we do not know how high to go. So romanization basically is you've got your forehead and halfway through your forehead, your nose begins to shoot off. So obviously that's a bit more exaggerated, but you get the point. So that's romanization, which gives you a very masculine look. So it's very important to know where the, the apex of, of the nose or the, the height of the nose is going to be. And for me personally, in my practice, these are the principles that I use. So in a male patient it's the infer inferior border of the brow whereas in the female patient it tends to be the the lash line still on the topic of assessment angles and proportions so these three are very important and especially the nasal labial angle so what what what, what is the nasal frontal angle so what you'll see um there's not a diagram here, but what you'll, the nasal frontal angle will be from the, the forehead to the dorsum of the nose. And then you have the nasal labial angle, which you'll be able to see in the first diagram over here. And then the nasal facial angle, which you, you won't see here. But essentially what the nasal facial angle is, if you imagine a line from the nasion to the subnasion to the pagonion, 
and then another line from the dorsum of the nose where they meet at the nasion, that is the nasofacial angle, which basically is at what angle is your nose um, coming down at. And the, like I said, the most important thing here especially is the nasal labial angle, which tends to be between 90 and 110 in females. And this is what we're trying to do in a non-surgical rhinoplasty. We assess the face from profile view, and we're trying to see how well the nose is projected and if they need elevation of the nose. And remember, assess them on animation first. Do they need botulinum toxin? Review, and then decide if they need um, dermal fillers. From experience, I find that botulinum toxin to the depressor septi nasi muscle two weeks later, the tip tends to have elevated by about three millimeters. So if you think about three millimeters, that's actually quite significant. Um, coupled with the fact that there's no movement of the tip. It's something I call a dancing tip. You know, every time they smile, the tip begins to wobble around and, and, and move. So, you know, they'll no longer have a dancing tip and they get two to three millimeters of elevation, which if you ask me is a very nice result. Still looking at further angles over here. So the, the first one is referring to the, the golden ratio. So at the radix of the nose, so the tip is going to be a 1.6. Tip of the nose to the middle of the lips will be a ratio of one. And obviously this ratio from will be one, and then from the lips to the pagonian or the chin is 1.6. So keeping into mind golden ratio, um, and also the, the ALAR um, base width, this is very important. And, as, and I remember saying this in last week's webinar, is that from the age of around 2021, 20, the intercanthal distance doesn't change. So why is that useful for us practice, practitioners? Well, simple. It means it's a very reliable landmark. So aesthetically, um, going by da Vinci's principles here and the golden ratio and the principles of beautification of the face, if the intercanthal distance doesn't change, then this is a fixed point and we can run this down the face as you can see, these two um, vertical lines here in red. And the ALAR width should be between these two lines. The width or the bulk of the lips should be between these lines. And also the width of the chin should be between these lines. This is why when it comes to perioral rejuvenation, I tend not to inject the lips, anything lateral to these intercanthal lines. And if you look at this Im image here on, on the right here, you'll see that the nostrils, or the ALAR base is slightly lateral to these lines and although you know i do appreciate that this is a cartoon image you can see the difference um, from this nose to this nose and lastly over here what you'll see what's drawn here in red is a supraciliary ridge and what you want to be able to do once you've done the procedure is if you put your index finger right um you know just inferior to the supraciliary ridge it should fit beautifully and it should be a nice curved like um, structure and these two lines are uh, following vertically down are your dorsal aesthetic lines which is what we're trying to re you know pr pronounce so to speak and this is what i ref was referring to earlier on with the light reflex you know if you get very good lighting and you shine it directly into the face and i often do this with a lot of my rhinoplasty patients is it's, it's their nose tends to be what the patient would describe as fat um, and as what we would say, it's just relatively flat. There's very flat, it's a flat nasal bridge. And if you think about it logically, if you're injecting product, whether it's with a cannula or cereal boluses down the midline, you're creating a little ridge or, or a mountain. Think of a mountain. So what's going to happen now after the treatment when the light is shining on the face? You're going to be creating a nice light reflex. And this principle applies to other parts of the face too, especially in the cheeks. You know, we're trying to create nice high arch cheekbones and then we get sub malar hollowing. So you're creating the light reflex on the cheeks and then the shadow underneath. So lights and shadows are very important as well as aesthetic lines. And just taking uh, more of a continuation, sorry, regarding assessment, there's projection and profile. So various lines, Steiner's lines and Ricketts lines in particular that you may have heard of. And we're just assessing the, the projection of the nose and its relation to inferior structures, which is your, your labi, as well as the chin. But remember, not one rule fits all. You know, I mean, somebody might have a nose coming out, you know, half a meter from their face. You know, they're not going to try and get their lips as big and their chin as big. Okay, so everything in, in uh, moderation. 
So what about the injection technique? So there's two main things that you will be using in your toolkit, and that's a needle and a cannula. Now, I often get asked, what do I use? Simple, I use a needle. Why? Because I love the precision of the tip of that needle. The second I press on the plunger, I know exactly where the product is. So, you know, the needle precision for me personally is a big thing for a very delicate structure like the nose. And as I said earlier on, for me, the nose pretty much makes or breaks the face. It's, it's not lips, it's not eyes for me, it's the nose. So my preferred method is using a needle. Do I use it with a cannula? Sometimes, yes, it's not a problem. It's all about knowing the underlying anatomy and then how you would do these things. So if you're gonna be using a needle, going back on the anatomy, knowing everything is off the midline and relatively superficial, where are we gonna stay? In the midline plane, and we're gonna be going deep onto periosteum or above the cartilage. Keep into consideration how deep your needle goes in over the cartilage, why? Because you don't wanna be penetrating it and losing the product. So in terms of anesthesia, you, you tend not to need anything. I mean, I don't really use much when it comes to using a 27 gauge needle. Sometimes I will use a 30 gauge needle or a 29 gauge needle. Um, or sometimes I will actually decant the product into what we call an ins insulin syringe, just because I find the fine motor control um, for me works, like, and, it, and it makes me feel more confident when injecting. But essentially 27, 28, 29, 30 gauge needle is absolutely fine. Whether you use topical anesthesia is entirely up to you. And then you've got a cannula. So if you're gonna use the cannula, studies have shown that a 27 gauge cannula is very similar to using a 27 gauge needle. So therefore, 25 gauge cannula would be ideal, entering at the tip, and then you wanna be feeding this along the midline superiorly. And to, to be honest with you, I've even done it the other way around. So I've injected uh, with my entry point superiorly and worked my way down inferiorly. The advantage you have at the tip is, once the cannula feeds its way up, you as you uh, bring the cannula out, you can actually then flip the cannula and head down um, towards the nasal spine and then you can actually help to try and elevate the tip or from one entry point so both of these have their benefits um, and I've, I tend to use uh, some 1% or 2% lidocaine at the tip if we're going to be using a cannula but these two are your main techniques when injecting the non-surgical rhinoplasty and looking at this image here um, by Hedda et al published in 2016 You'll see a classic dorsal hump. So I'm sure many of you will have seen this in your practice. And this is what we're trying to achieve afterwards. A nice straight nasal bridge, which looks for the most part more attractive on profile. And what happens as we're injecting? So you can see these little bubbles over here. So this is the HA that's above the dorsal hump. And then we've got HA beneath the dorsal hump. We've got some at the tip just to give a nice, very subtle ski slope over here. And then we also have some at the base of the, the nasal spine. Now, this injection per se, which is right at the base of the nasal spine, tends to be a little bit sore for the patient. So they'll definitely feel this without a doubt. And you're not trying to create a, a new nose here. All you're trying to do is create an illusion that the tip is now running up. Now, remember, these guys aren't having surgery, you know? so all we're doing is, you know, we're acting like magicians, so to speak. We're trying to create an illusion that on profile, the nose is now running upwards. So at the base of the nasal labial angle over here, that's where you add the product, be it needle, be it cannula, but it's nice and deep. And then you will push, if you look at this image here, so we're adding product right here at the base of the nasal spine. And then you can see it, it, it being put here in place. And this will push the skin out, so you can see now it looks like the nose is running superiorly. So you've, we've actually created an, an, an illusion. And if you're looking at the face on, on facial view, this is where we typically tend to inject hyaluronic acid. So in the midline of the nose, as you can see, around the tip, base of the nasal spine, and sometimes if you look here in the, a, sorry, in the alar ridge, just over here on, our, on each side. Now that's very important, especially in patients that have had surgical rhinoplasty. So if you take note, take, you know, try, try see if you can you know, use this in, in your practice. When you see a, a patient who's had, who has had a surgical rhinoplasty in the, uh, in the past, if you look at them on profile view, what you'll find is that the height of the nostril 
or the alar ridge begins to increase. So if they've had three or four surgeries, what tends to happen is the alar ridge gets higher and higher and higher. And so there's going to be more nostrils showing on profile view. And often what we tend to do is add some filler in the subcutaneous plane or in subdermal, sorry, um, just in the alar ridge. So what are the complications that can happen? Well, that's something for you guys to stay tuned um, on for next week's webinar. But this will give you a bit, a bit of an idea of what can potentially happen if you're not in the right plane or using the right technique. And here we've got a very classic um, example of vascular occlusion causing skin necrosis. And this is obviously as it was healing, but here, this is how it presented um, initially. And then within a few days, or I think it was around five or five to seven days after treatment, and when the patient's not been treated at all, so that they've had initial treatment, then they've not been seen for a week. And then if you look at picture B here, this is how they ended up. So this will occur if you obviously hit an intravascular, um, if you hit a vessel and you place intravascular product. And if you look at the initial picture here, you can see the beautiful demarcation of, of the vessels. So it's very important that we, we stay midline and we stay deep. And then we decide whether we're gonna use a needle, whether we're gonna use a cannula. And what you'll find is most patients that have these kind of complications that you're seeing on the screen tend to be people from the Far East, a lot of Chinese, because the main presenting complaint is a fat nasal, flat nasal bridge. Therefore, a lot of injections are happening in the glabella region, at the radix of the nose, and that's why a lot of complications come from that part of the world. Whereas in, in the Western world where we live in, we're too busy focusing on chiseled jaw lines, high arch cheekbones, you know, so the focus doesn't tend to be too much on the nose. Therefore, we see less of these complications. But to, to avoid these complications, it's very important to use small amounts of filler, so smaller aliquots of product. Remember, you can always go back in and add more. Low pressure injections, so you're not, you're not just yanking the whole syringe in. And anatomy, you know, I, I can't stress the importance of the, the underlying anatomy. But this I will talk about in a little bit more detail next week as to why this has happened and, and how we would go about managing it. But, you know, keep, keep the, the summary to this slide would basically be keep your um, anatomy knowledge up to date, stay midline and stay deep. And needle versus cannula doesn't matter at all. You know, if you're gonna have a complication with a needle, you'll have it with a needle and same with the cannula. What I find and what I, what I found in the literature also is, and, and if you think about it, it does make sense. If you're gonna enter a vessel intra, and obviously become intravascular with a cannula, your outcome is gonna be a lot worse than using a needle. Okay, so just some food for thought there. But again, cannula doesn't mean you're gonna be safer. You're more likely to have a intravascular occlusion using a needle, 100%. However, if you end up having one with a cannula, it tends to be a lot worse. Brilliant, so that brings me to the end of this webinar. I know this was quite, quite a short webinar, and to be fair with you, it was just the nose. Um, so, you know, it, it's nice to keep it nice and short, and Hopefully that was enjoyable and it covered a few things for, for you guys. So if you have any questions, do fire through and I will try and get through all of these questions. Here you'll see my Instagram uh, for both my clinical business as well as the training academy, which is actually just today I found out being renamed to the International Institute, Institute of Aesthetic Medicine. So you'll see a lot more of that being put all over over social media and the Academy of Aesthetic Medicine, which is the current name, um, is what the YouTube channel is under. So please go subscribe to the YouTube channel and that will just motivate me to, to make more content for you guys. So do follow those um, pages. I'll leave the screen up for, for a few more minutes whilst I'll look at the questions. Hi, Maurice. I kind of knew there was going to be a question from you. Um, so you're asking, what's the recommendation on ALAR slimming technique with Botox plays? So I tend to use one to two units um, injected very superficially 
on the ALR ridge on, on, on your patient, obviously. Um, and I find that gives a very nice result. You don't want to be collapsing their nose too much. Why? Because then they have, may have um, difficulty breathing or, you know, aesthetically it's going to be off and somebody would know that they've had some treatment done. So always under treat, bring them back a week, two weeks later and decide where you want to go. Somebody's asking, what is the entry point for the ALAR filler? Well, I don't use a cannula for ALAR filler. I tend to use an insulin syringe and I keep it very superficial given, you know, there's a lot, it's a very vascular area. But if you're subdermal in the ALAR ridge, that tends to give a very nice result. And again, it's a very small amount of product that you're going to be injecting. Hi, so, okay. so you're asking, do you do them in one sitting or multiple sitting to build a nose in these patients with no nasal bridge? Um, that's a very good question. So um, in my patients, I tend to do it over two sittings, sometimes even three sittings, but it, it depends on the clinical picture as always. Um, you know, if it's a very soft nasal bridge that they have, you know, you could potentially do it in one sitting. And the, the, the maximum amount of product that I tend to use is around one mil. I've found that I've never ever had to use more than one mil in the nose. But for most patients that come for a very subtle improvement of the nose with a slight dorsal hump, it tends to be a lot less than, than, than half a mil even. So you'll find with small amounts of product with a high G prime and that's very cohesive, you'll get a very nice result in the nose. But in, in general, it's a very tight compartment and you know, if you're gonna build a, a nasal bridge, it's nice to do it over two or even three sessions. Thanks, Karen. Thank you guys, lots of thank yous, thank yous. Hi, Areeb. So the strategy for the, the tip, lift, tip lift with filler. So, that's something that's it's easier for me to 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 showcase in person or via a live demonstration as to how I do a tip lift. But I'll try to get off the the screen here where I, and then you can maybe see me a little bit better. So basically, with the tip lift, what you're trying to do is first assess the face on profile view and try and get a good idea as to where the current tip is and where you would like to project it to. And often what you'll find on the dorsum of the nose, as the, tip, as the nose runs down, it begins to curve off. That's your supra tip region. And what we're trying to do is place product in the supra tip region to create a very small um, projection of the, of the nose, so to speak. And often what you'll find is where the nose is beginning to curve off, around three, two, three or four millimeters above this, tends to be a nice sweet spot for where you want the filler. Now, whether you inject from an inferior position like this, or whether you come from a superior position like this, is entirely up to you. But again, small amounts of product and just reassess. And you want something that's very, very high G prime and very cohesive, so it stays uh, as, as you've left it. Hi, Kathy. What are the volumes that are injected per site? So, um, as I was saying earlier on, I, I tend to use a maximum of one mil. Um, but often for very subtle cases, it tends to be a lot less. So I'm just going to stop the, the YouTube recording just now, and then we'll carry on with the live questions and answers. So thank you very much, everyone.